What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to review The Pigeon Tunnel, the latest documentary by Errol Morris, coming to Apple TV Plus on October 20th. I saw it yesterday at the New York Film Festival, and I absolutely loved it. Not to worry, I will not spoil a thing from the movie, but the title comes from the memoirs of British spy novelist John Le Carré, a.k.a. David Cornwell, who is the subject of this new documentary. And sadly, he died back in 2020 at the tender age of 89, but thanks to his many best-selling books and now this documentary, I have a feeling that Jean Le Carré is going to be gaining new fans, new readers, new admirers for many years to come. In any case, I feel a little bit like a charlatan reviewing this movie because I don't want to try and pretend as if I'm some expert on the work of Jean Le Carré. I read The, the Spy Who Came In From The Cold several years ago, and then last year, I finally read Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which I have right here, and as advertised... It was one of the most thrilling novels that I've uh, had the privilege to read in many years. But as soon as I got out of the theater last night, I immediately reached out to my friend Nick Barry, who's read quite a few of Jean Le Carré's books, maybe all of them, but he's an avid reader of his stuff and asked him what I should read next. And according to him, uh, in the George Smiley kind of sequence of stories, the next book on my to-do list would be The Honorable Schoolboy. So that should be arriving from uh, Amazon later today. But when it comes to film and TV adaptations, I've seen... A decent number. I mean, the most famous probably would be Martin Ritt's adaptation of The Spy Who Came In From The Cold with uh, Richard Burton. What the hell do you think spies are? Moral philosophers measuring everything they do against the word of God or Karl Marx? They're not. They're just a bunch of seedy, squalid bastards like me. That is particularly good. And I visited some of the locations from the film in Dublin when I was there last year to work on the documentary Once Upon a Time in Ireland. And I'll include a link to that doc in the description below. And I've liked a few others. I enjoyed John Borman's adaptation, The Tailor from Panama. I saw The Constant Gardener. I saw the most recent adaptation of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, but my understanding is that the Alec Guinness TV show from the 70s, uh, both on Tinker Tailor as well as uh, Smiley's People, apparently those are two of the best adaptations, maybe the best adaptations ever made. So those are next to my to-do list once I've read more of the George Smiley books. And I have absolutely no excuse for having not seen at least the first season of the Alec Guinness show so far because I've got the Blu-ray right here. It's been gathering dust on my shelf for about a year because somebody recommended it to me at some point. At any rate, I'm going to leave it out as a gentle reminder that I need to check it out. But this is not a review of the career of Jean Le Carré, nor is it a review of the many film and TV adaptations of his books. This is a review of the, doc of the documentary, The Pigeon Tunnel. And I must acknowledge I'm very biased because I've been a fan of Errol Morris for many years, or I've looked at his work, as John Le Carré says in the doc. Because when I was first getting into movies in the late 90s, Errol Morris was like an indie filmmaking god. And justifiably so. I mean, some of his documentaries... I they're probably the most entertaining documentaries ever made in any era, and a lot of people have kind of mimicked his style, taken inspiration from his style in the decades since he got a start back in the 1970s. But some of my favorites would include Gates of Heaven, Vernon, Florida. Vernon, Florida is a strong contender for the funniest fucking documentary ever made by a human being. But we also have The Thin Blue Line, A Brief History of Time, Mr. Death, The Fog of War, and Tabloid. Those are absolute classics and entertaining as hell. And he's made many other documentaries as well. And I strongly encourage everyone just to uh, dive right in. Which brings me full circle to The Pigeon Tunnel, which I suspect is not only going to thrill fans of Errol Morris, but is also going to thrill fans of Jean Le Carré and everything in that little overlap in that uh, Venn diagram. And it's a cliche to say this, but uh, they always say the best ideas are obvious in hindsight, or hindsight is 2020. Like, use whatever expression you like. But the same applies here because Errol Morris has been honing and refining this really specific interview style for many years where through his camera, he's able to make eye contact with the subject. And so it looks like his subject is not only looking into the lens of the camera, but it's make, he's making eye contact with a human being. And I think that changes the way people I guess, basically express themselves or what they're willing to unveil when they're looking into the eyes of an interviewer. Because right now I'm looking into the lens of a webcam on my computer and it's much easier to kind of bullshit my way through it or disguise what I want to say or I can kind of hide behind layers. But if I were looking into the eyes of someone that I know or a filmmaker or whatever, I would react and I would speak in a completely different way. And if anybody wants to look deeper into using this kind of technology, it's called the Interatron. Who knows? Maybe now the technology is very widespread. But in the late 90s, it was uh, kind of rare and hard to come by. But what never occurred to me until I started watching this documentary is just how close Errol Morris's interview style is to an interrogation. And this is obviously a topic that Jean Le Carré knows quite a bit about. 
and as he says in the trailer, are you my friend across the fire? Who are you? And what's hilarious about watching this documentary is seeing how Errol Morris, who's used to being the interrogator or the interviewer, just how frequently Jean, John Le Carré is able to turn the tables on him. And John Le Carré, I mean, he's a very willing participant. It's not like he's like in a jail cell being like interviewed against his will. He wants to divulge. He wants to share. But he just can't help kind of falling back on these old tricks. Because for those people who don't know, in the late 50s and early 60s, before becoming a best-selling novelist, Jean Le Carré did have a brief career as an intelligence officer for MI5 and MI6. And he gained quite a bit of experience with interrogation techniques, spycraft, etc. So he knows all the tricks that Errol Morris might employ before Errol Morris even thinks about which tricks he wants to use next. But the good news is Errol Morris didn't have to work too hard to get his subject to open up because he's more than happy to discuss his childhood, his education, and his professional life, and all of which I basically found completely fascinating. I wish the documentary were an entire season of television instead of just a feature film. Thankfully, I can always read John Le Carré's autobiography, and I imagine that a lot of people will watch this documentary. It'll feel like an appetizer, and they'll feel compelled to pick up the book. And I don't want to spoil the inspiration for this title and that Errol Morris does a brilliant job of recreating the scene from John Le Carré's childhood where he got the inspiration for this kind of visual metaphor that not only applies to the characters in his books but also just so many different aspects of life but it's one of the best parts of the movie because Errol Morris has always uh, has always excelled at recreating kind of live action portrayals of the stories that his interview subjects are sharing. And that goes all the way back to the Thin Blue Line, where he quite literally saved a man's life who was on death row for a murder that he did not commit. But the scene that inspired the title of The Pigeon Tunnel, it's the perfect visual metaphor for stories about spies and double agents. And a big part of this documentary is figuring out we're trying to unpack or dig into how do you identify and recruit the talent to work as a spy or as a double agent because you need people who are a little bit bad, but at the same time, very loyal, but also people who don't entirely fit into the environment in which they find themselves because Jean Le Carré had one of the most unconventional childhoods imaginable. And I can't even begin to do justice by trying to do a quick summary. But his father was essentially a con man and a scammer and like a borderline criminal. And so much of Jean Le Carré's childhood involved kind of like fleeing from one house to another where they were like, you know, afraid of being tracked down by the mob and that sort of thing. But his father was also involved in politics. His father was involved in a lot of things. But his father, I guess to use a modern day expression, was the consummate bullshit artist. He was a faker. He was a fraud. He was a scammer. And while it might have seemed thrilling as a child, because Jean Le Carré grew up in this environment, he was uniquely equipped to go into the world of spycraft, where everybody's constantly lying to one another. And what's fascinating about the mentality or the psychology of a lot of these spies, they don't come from a place of like ideology or patriotism. A lot of them are just addicted to the thrill, like to the juice of being involved in this situation where you're constantly in danger of being discovered or found out. And for a lot of these individuals who are double agents, being a double agent has less to do with politics and more to do with just the thrill and the excitement of just being close to the action, being cl like kind of flying way too close to the sun. And it was absolutely thrilling hearing Jean Le Carré speak at length on that topic. And obviously you can learn all you want to know on that front just from the way he depicts his characters in his novels. But what also made John Le Carré a fantastic candidate to be recruited into this world is how, in spite of growing up like basically in the household of like a borderline criminal slash con artist, he was being educated amongst like the poshest, the most elite, and most uh, aristocratic Brits imaginable because his father always wanted him to have a world-class education. So John Le Carré, he was, he was very aware of the fact that he did not belong in this crowd, but he learned to talk like they did. He learned to dress like they did. He learned to act like they did. So he was already familiar with the um, kind of living a life of deception day in and day out in sports, in the classroom, etc. And I think a lot of viewers will be genuinely caught off guard by just how moving and just how sad a lot of these chapters from John Le Carré's childhood are because while he might have found them thrilling as a kid, looking back he realizes just how unusual his childhood uh, turned out to be. And even though Errol Morris is getting up there in years now, it's incredible how he still directs his movies with the energy and the vitality of a very young filmmaker, and at this point he's an absolute master of juggling multiple formats as he's telling the stories because you've got the interview subject, you've got documentary footage, you've got like, newspaper clippings and a clipping from books. Like you got all that rigorous detective style research that Errol Morris excels at, but he's also gotten increasingly good at doing all of his live action reenactments. And so as he's juggling all these different formats simultaneously, you basically you realize you're in the hands of a master storyteller, even if he's a so-called documentary filmmaker. And I feel like 
Errol Morris's approach to tackling his topics, it's like it's the perfect style to reflect the topics that he's exploring in this particular documentary. But if you set aside all the spy thrillers and all the spy craft and all that fascinating stuff and all the real life history that inspired all of John Le Carre's characters, in the end, I feel like this documentary is just a love song to the creative process because as you listen to John Le Carre speak, you realize, I feel like in my mind, there's two, ty- two kinds of writers. They're the kind of writers who will write all day because they love the euphoria when they're finished, when they can say, like I wrote 10,000 words today, like now I've gotten that out of my system and now I can relax and like, you know, smoke my pipe and watch the news and blah, blah, blah. But they love the feeling of having written. And then there are the writers out there who just love to write, where they almost don't even care what they're writing. They just love the creative process of like smashing their fingers on a keyboard. And you can tell that Jean Le Carré is one of the latter. He loves to fucking write. I have a feeling that even if millions of people weren't buying his books, and let's be honest, millions of people were buying his books for many, many years. I mean, he is very well off, or he was very well off when he finally um, reached the end of his journey. But I have a feeling he would have been scribbling away for hours a day, whether nobody was reading his stuff or everybody was reading his stuff. But uh, I'm real excited to uh, dive into more of his work. But I'm starting to realize just how hard it is to review a documentary with so many great scenes without spoiling the stuff. So I think I better just go ahead and wrap this up. I'll just say, if if you've never watched the documentaries of Errol Morris, if you've never read the books of Jean Le Carré, I strongly recommend both. I'm still at the very much at the beginning of my journey when it comes to discovering Jean Le Carré, so if anybody has any recommendations down below for great t- film and TV adaptations or just his best novels, but luckily he has legions of fans out there who've already written comprehensive guides to like basically the best and worst of his work, but it seems like his diehard fans, they basically start at the beginning and they just read everything moving forward. I don't know if I'll ever graduate to one of those like fanatics, but who knows, after I read read uh, an honor, the, uh, was it an honorable schoolboy or the honorable schoolboy? Yeah, the honorable schoolboy. But who knows, if that one really sucks me in, I might end up becoming one of the fanatics. And Errol Morris, I'm thrilled to uh, realize that uh, I've still got a decent number of his movies left to watch, so I'll definitely be doing more of a deep dive on his career. But at this point, yeah, I think he's maybe my favorite documentary filmmaker who has ever lived. In in any case, just as a reminder, this documentary is coming to Apple TV Plus on October 20th. So if you don't have an Apple TV Plus account, be sure to subscribe. Or if you already own a bunch of Apple devices, you probably do have an Apple TV Plus account, even if you've never used it, but uh, it's such a strange streaming service where it's almost like an afterthought for Apple, but they work with all these great filmmakers like Martin Scorsese and Ridley Scott and Errol Morris. I don't know what Apple's long-term goals are with this platform, but at a minimum, they're giving a lot of really cool filmmakers a lot of really cool opportunities. So just for this documentary alone, I think it's worth getting a subscription for a month to check it out. But that's all I've got to say on The Pigeon Tunnel. Thank you so much for listening to my reaction and review, and if you enjoyed it, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell and hunt me down on Twitter at Colbrex. But thank you so much for listening to me, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.